All right, so uh, first item on the agenda, I just want to give a public service announcement. Uh, so we've just officially published the 2022 is still security audit. Uh, you can see the blog and uh, tweet links here. Uh, so this is something that um, uh, the we've gone through was uh, CNC, uh, through CNCNF as well as a outside uh, security consultant called Ada Logic. And uh, this is an important step in getting STL to CNCF graduation. So I just want to get a shout out to everyone who has contributed. All right. So, Kostin, you have the next item. Do you want to share? Do you want me to share? Uh, you can share if you want. Um, it's probably past that. So there's a lot of comments and discussion on the on the document. I don't know if the proposal is as controversial as it sounds. I mean, I haven't seen any comment disagreeing that it's good to have telemetry data that in access log and traces and so forth that is trustworthy. The main discussion is if distinguished name is the right place to put it and, and which distinguished name to use, I mean, the existing ones to put to define new ones or or, or some other variation. Um, I, I, I suspect it's good to leave it open for discussion a bit more because in ambient there is a separate proposal to use SNI uh, for uh, pod to pod, and that will imply that will use SNI the pod ID in some form as SNI, and that would probably imply that it will be good to also have a sun with the pod ID. There is one of the comments in this document also that is discussing if, if using the, the pod ID as a DNS sun is, is uh, a good alternative because that's a perfect natural fit. Um, so I don't know how, how to proceed with this document because again, some of the documents are valid but not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, clear cut uh, true or false or or, or uh, so it's basically opinion <laughs> about is, should we allow people to use distinguished name for some policy decisions or would adding some information distinguished name hurt us in the long term because people will start using them without our knowledge or consent and using some envoy filter sets outside of the scope and nothing that we can control so i don't think it's something that can be addressed um my take would be that we should you know if a ca is willing to add information we should take advantage of it and citadel should include at least a pod, pod information for you know to have at least some some piece of uh, trustworthy data um any opinion should TOC decide? I don't know. John, do you have an opinion on the decision process for this at least? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I struggle with the same thing. Um, I mean, it would be good to get feedback from folks relevant, we men, maybe the cert manager folks or something that do certificates, spiffy folks. I mean, yeah, and without that, it's just kind of what some people that aren't experts on this <laughs> decide, right? So, yeah, yeah, one point, I don't know if it was made clear, sorry, uh, is that Google CA in particular does include pod information as a cert. And my, you know, not necessarily hidden, but, but my intention was to take advantage of whatever a CA decides to certify. So if... I, I don't think it's anything wrong with 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 uh, us taking advantage of what the CA decides to provide. So if Google CA is providing the pod ID, we should probably have some code to be able to extract it without having a strong dependency on Google CA. If cert manager decides to support adding some additional information, we should follow the lead and maybe let them decide what they want to put in the certificate in the certificate and have some flexible way to take advantage of extracting information from cert and using in telemetry so maybe we should not necessarily as decide but let other other organizations decide and have a flexible way to pull sorry Limen, go ahead yeah i i haven't read this proposal carefully so is the proposal to add this uh, extra metadata in the distinguished name or other fields 
uh, it, uh, the, the intent is to, to, to have information certified by the CA used in telemetry. I don't really care where it goes. I don't really care how it's extracted, as long as it's uh, we can we can have something that is not completely generated by the client. So an attacker can pretend to be in a different workflow, different data center, and we just report telemetry with the, whatever the attacker is uh, is injecting. So yeah. any information CA provides should wherever they put it, basically. Yeah, I think not only telemetry, authorization policy can also take advantage of it. Uh, like a, that's a separate yeah. discussion. I want to make a discussion. I mean, if you want to have a proposal to to use certified information in addition to to the uh, SPFI identity in the certificate, that's wonderful. I support it, but it's your proposal. My my focus is on telemetry. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we want a set of trusted metadata in the certificate, and uh, exactly which field to put in. Uh, yeah. For Istio, we can recommend our own way, but if you want to make it a, a standard, I think that will require longer discussion. Uh, I, I, I completely agree. I, I don't think we have the capability to create a standard for, for this Istio organization itself. Uh, we should, you know, follow the lead of CAs. If CAs, what CAs, we should be able to, to get data they provide. We should recommend something like Kubernetes. Kubernetes is using organization, organization units in their certificates. We could do the same short term until a standard emerges. But I don't think we can block or should should wait for some magic organization to define a standard for uh, for this kind of stuff. Right, yeah. Yeah, maybe we should uh, uh, collect the data. What are the so, uh, what are the metadata country included in the CA search? I know Google CA is using extension. I, I don't know about other CA, how they include the metadata. Um, yeah, Kostin, do you want to um, leave this uh, offline? Maybe we can comment more on yeah. the comments. Yeah. We, we we can discuss it discuss it offline as well. Yeah, I, I put references of, of how, how uh, you know, Kubernetes in particular is using the, the organization organization unit and, and, and mention about uh, the, the extensions that uh, Google CA is using. But again, we, 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 we need to be flexible. That's my, my, my TLDR here. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Makes sense. Yeah, on the, on the use cases, we're talking about telemetry. So how would that work? Like we connect and then if the metadata is in the certificate, we use that. If not, we do the baggage metadata exchange stuff. Yep, we fall back to to, to previous. Uh, yeah, and and also if it's in a jot, if a jot, if request includes a jot, jot has information that is you know usable. I mean, it's it's like the Kubernetes jot that has namespace and pod ID in the jot. We should also always prefer trustworthy information over over untrusted information. Yeah, right now I I actually have other similar requirements, which is uh, adding the cluster information into the certificates. And we can use it in the election policy. That's a use case I have in mind. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I know right now, uh, like the, some of the networking policy, uh, net, Kubernetes network policy already has, a, like CDN policy already, already has uh, authorization. Uh, you, can, you can say allow the, um, the access from the same cluster. And uh, we can do the same thing. So uh, that's yes, my case I have in mind. Absolutely, and, and and I have the same use case for telemetry because it's very useful to know if you see a denial of service from from a particular cluster, you should be able to block or, or shut down that particular cluster and not let the attacker pretend to be in a different cluster. That's that's useful for telemetry, useful for a lot of other things. Um, one point on this, which was discussed in the in the ambient uh, SNI uh, document, is that we want to represent the pod, uh, you know, fully qualified domain name as some pod name, the namespace, and then something that is uh, uh, the suffix that is specific to the cluster. So, so the when you so it's basically uniquely identified since you can have the same pod name, same namespace in two different clusters. The rest of the domain should qualify exactly the cluster. So that information will probably come naturally in the in the fully qualified domain name we may or may not use for SNI in, uh, in Ambient. 
and and that's not controversial. I mean, that's a DNS name. That's that's a host name. That that has a clear representation in 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 uh, in a certificate. Yeah. Yeah. So extension is one example I see. I uh, did you see other example like including the metadata in the uh, Yeah, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is the main the main uh, offender here. So Kubernetes is using for the for the node certificates and for the for the client certificates they support. They use organization and organization unit to represent uh, this type and, and common name to some extent. Oh, it's, it's at the end of the document. I see. The add is to the common name. Uh, no, organization, organization unit. So organization represents, I believe, namespace. So uh, organization unit is actually used for groups or some other combination. At the end, I have a reference with all the uses I found so far. OK, I see, I see. Uh, do you have an example of the certificate in your doc, like Kubernetes, uh, or maybe some link? There is a link to the Kubernetes doc, which they have an example there. OK, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I think we can, uh, we can reveal all the existing usage of the um yeah uh, where to put the metadata in the certificate okay okay and then we can start slow i mean it, it can be done first on ambient and and you know starting maybe with just just the pod and then we can slowly move forward with other things as we gain experience feedback and so forth mm -hmm. yeah sounds good okay i'll go down this topic all right then let's move on to the next one uh is that right? Is Aaron on the call? I'm guessing he's not because he's in uh, Asian time zone. Um, but oh. I, can, I think I know what he is after, so maybe I can speak on his behalf. Um, so there's this PR to add this feature to, to telemetry. Um, I think there's kind of two parts. One is, can we promote um, this feature to, or the API to beta without this feature? And the other is, should we add the feature, right? So on, on the first one, I think it's it's pretty clear that we we can promote it, right? That we promote based on stability and usefulness and feedback and, and whatnot. And I think telemetry is meeting all those goals, not necessarily that it's feature complete. Um, so I, I have absolutely no problem. I mean, there there may be other things that are blocking it, uh, but certainly I don't think this should block a promotion to beta. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 it, you know we we never blocked promote to beta because some extra feature was not added. Any disagreement, or we have something? Oh, to one thing is um, telemetry API that page is it tested? I'm seeing not tested. I'm not sure if it's tested in preliminary. No, we're not saying, Lynn, that we're promoting it to beta. We're just saying that this feature missing should not block it from beta. There may still be other things blocking it from beta, like testing. OK, testing. got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, okay, we should and resolve all those issues, because it would be great to promote this. <laughs> yeah, so I guess the question is, does anyone on the call in the community know people are using the features that Zeran is adding? I mean, I, I don't think the issue is if anyone is using it or will find it useful. The issue is if this feature is something that we can support long term, and if it makes sense with ambient, with with uh, you know, cross interoperability, and and for other features. So it's super tight to envoy, and it's not entirely clear how how anything else can use it. Okay, so it's not just whether this feature is popular or not, but also can we support it in ambient? Yeah, and not just ambient, just in general as well in, in Istio. Uh, and there's a lot of features in Envoy, right? We don't necessarily want to add them all. Uh, so like right now, I don't see much evidence that it is, but there's no evidence at all, so it's hard to say. Um, so I, I do think like the the bar of, of motivation that this is something that we need and is useful and can be support hasn't been met right now. Um, but I don't think there's enough information to say that, like, no, we should not do this feature, just that we haven't met that bar yet. Yeah. 
here. Makes sense. It sounds like no one has an opinion either. Uh, one more piece of the information, since we're discussing telemetry and we discussed telemetry in the previous topic as well. Uh, there are a lot of discussions and both in, in Istio and proxy GRPC community and a lot of other places about adopting open telemetry. And open telemetry comes with a bunch of, you know, strong opinions on their own and some APIs on their own. So uh, I think at some point, I don't know, TOC or, or, or the community, we need to take a stance on this, decide if we want to, to move to open telemetry. And if we do, we should reevaluate our APIs in, in light of what, what open telemetry does and you know, maybe default hotel, maybe something like else. But um, especially for new APIs and new features, we should evaluate if they are compatible or how they are aligned with open telemetry service. Oh, that's a good point. It does open telemetry provides API that would impact over telemetry API today? They Cause, do. Cause my they impression don't. is yeah. it's under the cover, right? How you collected the data. So I I had thought telemetry API would still be in place even if we move to OTA. John. Sorry, my hand was for uh, after Lynn, so you can answer that uh, if you. Uh, yeah, I can quickly answer this. So, so uh, Open Telemetry defines a protocol, but they also define the semantic conventions, and they expect a lot of vendors to adopt those semantic conventions. They have an entire ecosystem across multiple things that generates uh, the metrics with uh, the semantic convention is labels and 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 the name of the metric. So, adopting Open Telemetry, the main thing will be to also support gradually move to the Open Telemetry. Uh, semantic conventions. Uh, they have a collector and, and there is a, an entire ecosystem that is processing and pipelining and doing open telemetry um, processing and each of them defines some APIs. I mean, the open telemetry collector has an API, the, the flag, friend bit or something, whatever. I, I found two other uh, applications in the open telemetry ecosystem that allow you to manipulate the, the stream of metrics and you know, one of them is using SQL, for example, to derive data from access logs and, and similar. Uh, uh, but it's a large ecosystem. It's, it's pretty hard to to, 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 to to figure out how they overlap. It's, uh, I just started to look into this a few, few weeks ago. So um, I'll come back to this later. Okay, got you. So that, I guess that could be another uh, challenging for promoting this to beta too. Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. From, from what I've seen so far, is what the limited set we have is not interfering with the open telemetry. I mean, it's not uh, the part where we have problems. Uh, and we did the same thing for 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 uh, you know authorization, knowing that ambient will probably have a different. So my my take is probably if we adopt open telemetry, it will be an ambient first, just like with the modified uh, you know semantics for authorization, slightly modified semantics for other things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so promoting this to beta or stable is not necessarily a problem because we'll support sidecar as a current model for a very, very long time. So it's not no proposal to drop what we have at any point. It's just that we'll also support open telemetry and we expect people to move to open telemetry maybe when they adopt ambient or maybe, you know, independently. Right, yeah, but uh, you didn't want to have the API drastically differently for open telemetry and ambient. I mean, if they are not, I, that wouldn't uh, make an impact to beta. Yeah, so far it doesn't sound. I mean, uh, again, if I, if the other people more familiar with open telemetry find conflicts, they should speak up. That's my my. Uh... So for for this PR, I I, I look at the uh, the content of this PR. It doesn't introduce, uh, for example, the. Uh, uh definition on the labels so it doesn't uh i would say it will not uh, conflict with the open telemetry direction and uh, uh so basically open tele like uh costly mentioned like open telemetry has two parts one is the uh, standard for api and uh, another is the standard for labels so for this one i think it's just some high level metric definition but it doesn't conflict with the uh, labels, for example, it doesn't say it uses, uh, you know, particular labels um, format. So I don't think it will uh, will will conflict with our direction on open telemetry. Uh, 
this is about the whole open trimit you have today. I mean, the new feature is a completely separate item. I mean, John. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, this is kind of repeating what Kostin said, but it would be very nice if someone took on doing kind of a deep dive in open telemetry and how it will and should relate to Istio and kind of wrote up a, a doc of the current state and maybe even what we should do. Um, I think that'd be useful. I, I could volunteer someone, but <laughs> hopefully someone will volunteer for that. Um, yeah, I, I can take a look up at that. Uh, but uh, overall, the idea is, uh, so for the open census API part, uh, that will be uh, uh, deprecated. We will going to use open telemetry API. Uh, and also for the label part, we're going to conform to the open telemetry uh, semantic uh, uh, labels. They have a standard for that. So that's the overall idea. Uh, Lay to, to, to I, I feel the need to always say, we are not deprecating anything. We'll keep what we have existing working for for foreseeable future, but we'll also support open telemetry. So there is. Yes, I don't think yes. anyone plans anything about removing a feature or, or changing a feature that works. Yes, today. we are going to have public preview and GA, yeah. and based on the feedback, we can choose which one becomes the default option. Yes. But uh, before that happens, yeah. the existing one will continue works. Thanks, Lai. I was hoping that you would uh, volunteer for this. So it's <laughs> good. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, anything else on, on this topic? Okay, I take that as a no. All right. Well, uh, Sebastian and Lucas, it's uh, your turn. Cool. Thanks. Uh, nice to meet you all. First time here. So hopefully uh, I'll say the right things. And uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully this is not too controversial, the proposal. Um, we're looking to add OCSP stapling uh, to Istio gateways. So this concerns only uh, what I'm going to call external certificates, which is uh, not the certificates which are used for MTLS within the mesh, but rather Certificates which are used to kind of uh, secure uh, like uh, downstream connections from a client, external client to an SEO gateway. Um, for those who aren't too familiar with OCSP, um, it's essentially an alternative to certificate uh, revocation lists in which the server attaches a kind of uh, proof that the certificate is still valid. Um, and this is what we call the OCSP staple. Um, it's just a little bit that says um, that's signed by the CA uh, with a expiry date and signature and says, yep, this certificate is still valid. And it means clients uh, don't all have to independent, independently reach out to the CA to check the um, status of the uh, certificate. Um, so the way we propose adding uh, OCSP stapling to gateways is um, similarly to the way um, we kind of currently fetch certificates, uh, which is just by looking up a value in a secret. Um, so we leave the kind of implementation of getting the staple to an external third party, a cert manager or an independent provider or something like that. Um, and uh, we have to make two small modifications to the API, uh, to the gateway field. One to tell Envoy how to do the stapling. So uh, Envoy has three kind of stapling modes. One which allows for no staple. Uh, one which will ignore a non-valid staple, but use the staple if it's there. Um, and one which is uh, strict stapling. So if there is no staple, uh, there will be no TLS and Jake. Um, so that's the first one. And the second one is, um, at the moment, the certificates uh, and the key are looked up in the secret through kind of well-known paths, tls.crt and tls.key, which are kind of Kubernetes standards almost, I want to say. Um, but there is no such standard for OCSP staples. So we propose adding a path so that uh, the kind of, as long as there is no implementation standard for this um, in Kubernetes, we can kind of uh, adapt to if there are different uh, provider or external provider uh, implementations that use different paths for the staples, we can provide that. Um, and then the rest is kind of similar to, um, well, it's very similar to the way 
um, certificates and keys are pushed to Envoy. It uses SDS um, and use and pushes the um, staples as inline bytes. So we haven't read the doc. Do you have a reference with anyone else doing this on other environments except Kubernetes? I mean, on VMs, on other. I'm sorry. What do you mean? So, uh, how is then files are named? How they are represented? How how different CAs generate those things? Yeah. Um, yeah. So so the the way the OCSP staple is generated isn't really um, kind of looked at here. We we assume that's a problem solved by someone else. Um, so we assume an external provider is going to provide the staples at a certain path. Um, and then the job of the user is to actually provide this path to the gateway and say, in the secret, that, that is where your staple is going to be located. I think the staple itself is described in extension to TLS uh, standard. Uh, it has its own uh, RSP. And uh, the inline bytes that we are uh, passing is just uh, their encoded uh, staple, uh, which is returned from the CA. So the reason I ask, sorry, John, uh, is because we have three different paths to get uh, the, the certificate. So there is a platform provider, which is like Spire agent or or uh, set manager with CSI, where something completely external to ECO provides the entire thing. There is a ECOD, especially for gateways. That's a kind of what we recommend for people for gateways, not for work identity, but to, to, to use ECOD integration. And then ECOD has an integration with something that gets a certificate because Citadel doesn't provide staples, or today doesn't provide staples. And that's a part where I'm trying to figure out how, how, how it fits, because let's say we implement it, ECOD will do it with, because that's a recommended practice. We don't want to move back to secrets. And then what? That's really the question. So, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't fully understand. Uh, so uh, my understanding was that it was uh, like uh, agnostic of uh, where the certificate comes from. Yeah, I think the scope of this proposal is for external certificate. It's not the certificate STOD issue. No, but STOD gets the certificates from somewhere. Do we, do we get them from CERT? Do we get them from other different CA? Do we, John, can you probably you go ahead and listen? Yeah, that's that, that's kind of what I was trying to ask. You say, okay, we have this path. If you could try scroll down to where there's some like those in it, we have this path. Um, what is the path to? It's it's not a file system, right? It's it, is it a key within the secret? Or, that's yeah. Oh, it, yes, it's a key one. within secret. Okay, so they have like three yeah. fields, like the the key, the search, and then this new OCSP yeah. thing. Exactly. Yeah. And it's Does that alleviate your error answer or alleviate mm -hmm. your concern, Kasten? No, no, no. That, that, that's that's what I was looking for. So, so you were expecting them to be putting the secret by whoever created the secret uh, from the external. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So we assume this. Okay. The, the assumption here is this will, will be part of the same secret as the TLS and the key. As the TLS cert and the key, um, they'll be in one kind of secret together. One their different keys. Okay. So, is the idea is not involved. It's just reading secret. Whatever is in secret passing through doesn't. Okay. So that's perfect. I have no concern. Yeah, so the the pass here is a uh, it is a file pass or it's a it's not a file path. It's a it's a YAML key essentially, right? It's just the, the key under which it's stored in the secret. Uh, so I guess yeah, path is a bad name for it. Uh, then it gets confusing. Yeah, we use a name for the other thing, and and yeah. or, but can we just define a standard one or work kind not standard? That's uh, because more options means more tests, more complexity, more. So we can tell people, just like we tell people to, you have to use tls.crt, tls.key, we can tell them to use ocsp.dir or whatever you want. And that's what I was asked as well. Like, I think I saw a certain Andrew was at this. Uh, is that right? And do they have a value that we can just use and say that you must use this? Um, so they don't at the moment. The, the idea is we then go to cert manager and say, "Here's how we do CSV stapling, and um, and please add it." So I think that, that was the idea. So if we can agree on if we can agree on a key here, um, then I think this is what we can use when we do a PR to cert manager. So that's what we did for the key and certificate and the root certificate. I don't think we should uh, the 
TLSP this requires a, a special API to define the name on every single dozen. And we for we actually have multiple parts that we check. We check, for example, we we check TLS, but there is another ones that we we we, we use. Mm -hmm. So we can auto detect if necessary. So if there are three or four common, yeah, I agree. Like let's let's pick one, and if if we pick wrong, a certain manager or someone that has more weight than us picks a different key, we can just add multiple keys. Like no one's going to be confused by OCSP dot dir versus OCSP key or something, right? Those are very clearly meant for this. Um, so, so then the the recommendation by Lukash was to do something like TLS dot OCSP, um, so that we kind of follow the TLS dot key, TLS dot cert. Yeah, if we find someone who's using it, use it. If not, pick some placeholder. And if the first certificate that generates this, we pick whatever they do. Because okay. we can I'll have a look around and if there's anything that does it already that uses particular convention. Uh, I'm, I'm just um, uh, not concerned. I'm just curious if um, the additional flexibility added with this API wouldn't be a benefit, because that uh, way we can Istio can be agnostic of the uh, provider of secrets so it can be search manager or it can be other third-party controller which is updating and issuing the, uh, the certificates and also prefetching the uh, OCSP staples and putting them in the secrets uh, so with this option actually there's a lot more flexibility it also uh, allows to use secret of type which is not Kubernetes TLS, and for instance, OPEC secrets. Uh, so Isn't it the answer an to this added is, value? I, I think it's not an added value, quite the opposite. I mean, if we don't allow this for the TLS key, TLS certificate, root certificate, probably OCSP is the least important of them all in terms of uh, of this kind of flexibility. And it would be completely odd and, and difficult for the user to, you know, to deal with this because hey, TLS key, TLS certificate cannot be modified, and we support multiple patterns for common vendors. But for OCSP, I need to know exactly what my my vendor is using, and I know what exactly what the secret is. And so that's not. I would even say even the entire API here to OCSP is probably not necessary, and we should be optional because if the user put an OCSP with the expected pattern, it's clear that they express intent to use OCSP. We don't need to also put some. Uh, you know, configurations that they will need to deal with and maintain and deal with if it's missing. So I would just scrape the API and, and rely on the content of the secret. Yeah. How about the, yeah. yeah, having the default value and uh, if the customer is advanced data enough, they can specify the configuration for key type. But you don't do it for, for TSP, so why would we do it for CSP? If we want yeah, to do it for everything, yeah. Our API should be conservative, not, um, I don't know what the word is. <laughs> not not yeah, not lot like uh just in case why this field right we should yeah. once there's overwhelming demand for a field that becomes so obvious that we need it then it's time to add it not once we you know think that there there might be use cases. i kind of explaining what austin said what is this mode like I'm, it's not clear to me why you would ever have a mode that's not mandatory right if you have the staple then why, why would you not want to use it those are so, three modes supported by the Envoy itself. So we are just forwarding the value to allow a gateway to configure underlying Envoy. But is there any, I, like, I don't care what Envoy so, does. So they, they have APIs there there are yeah. clients that, are, that will be configured so that they'll use an OCSP staple if it's there. Uh, but if it's invalid, for example, uh, say there was a failure to go fetch the other staple, then the client will use CRLs or some other mechanism to go check. So there is value in having the modes so that if the staple fails, you can still do a TLS handshake, um, but but this is a server config, right? Yeah. So why does the client matter? The client matters because in um, because this is what buys the OCSP staple, right? If you say if you say everything mandatory, um, then you lose the function, the the kind of flexibility of having allowing the client to go check for CRL. Whereas, if but, when, uh, but my suggestion was okay. If we so okay, we're configuring Envoy. We have a listener. We have a certificate. Mm -hmm. If there's an OCSP staple there, set it yeah. to mandatory. If there's not one there, then don't set anything at all. Right? There's either two cases. There's no stapling or there's stapling. It's not clear to me where this murky middle ground is, where there might be a staple. Like we know it's there, right? We're yeah, the one giving it to Envoy. A, yeah, I think we need a two modes instead of three modes. Either require OCSP stapling or it's uh, do not require. 
so it's similar to the authentication policy like a but there's no uh, user can thing needed. They either have the staple or they don't, right? I may be completely misunderstanding how stapling works. I'm I'm no expert here, so please educate no, me. No, so 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 there is there is value in, in at least having two modes. Um, because you might want clients to be forced to use those CSP staples, and if they're not there, fail and don't do a TLS handshake at all. So that's what the mandatory mode does, right? But you might want to provide an OCSP staple. But if there is no OCSP staple, then you still do a handshake and you allow that connection to proceed. I don't understand how you can provide the staple and then there's not a staple. If so you provide it, then you can have, it there. In have a staple that's not valid. So the staples are have a very short lifetime. They might be like a few days. Um, and if there is a failure, for example, on the provider to fetch the latest, the latest staple, um, you might not want your TLS handshake to fail because of that. You might want to allow that TLS handshake and let the client do a CRL lookup instead. But 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 the, the expiration is in the staple. So so uh, the server can when it loads the staple can verify it's valid or not and treat invalid staple as no staple because there is no point to send it if it's invalid. But that's uh, the same as uh, the strict MQS mode versus uh, the uh, what the. It's not entirely. It's the same with an expired certificate, maybe. But uh, again, uh, John John is right. I mean, if the user has a valid step, the server for the server side at least, if there is a valid step, it should be used. If not, don't use it. I mean, I don't think it's it's there is point to say mandatory when you don't have a step of fail or. Well, but again, again there, there is because you might not, you might want to refuse any connections that don't have an OCSP staple. Right? You have, you have to have a way to indicate that. If a lack of a lack of OCSP staple doesn't indicate whether or not you want there to be a staple. Uh, are you talking client API or server API? Because they're different. Uh, right. so that's that's completely separate. Or, or clients don't know and care about the server API. So that's that what you have here is a server API. Now, destination yeah. rule rejecting or not is a different story. But that, but that's what I'm saying, right? Like you, you, the the lack of the lack or of staple doesn't indicate whether or not you want your server to be trying OCSP stapling. It's not because there is no staple presence that you that you want your TLS handshake to go forward. It, it feels like a weird like you could say the same thing for just normal TLS. Like okay, as an admin, I want everything to be TLS and then a user goes and creates a gateway that doesn't have TLS, right? Like that, that it's almost like this admin level config above the Istio APIs that is like restricting the usage, which is kind of something that I would expect something like Gatekeeper or OPA or whatever to do, right? Like if a user wants to always have OCSP staples, then just make sure that all the certificates you reference in your gateway have the, the field there, right? Uh, which is something that came validated by external system. Like the user is providing their intent. If you want an additional admin policy, it's it feels like that's outside of Istio scope. Yeah. Yes and no because you might want you might fetch an OCSP staple and staple be not valid, um, or you might fail to fetch a staple. So you'll have a staple in your certificate, but that staple won't be valid because it's expired. For example, um, in that but then we case, in this case, gatekeeper would still say, "Yep, yeah, you have a staple. Good to go." Um, but your staple, the staple that's actually sent to the client, isn't valid anymore. But, but I mean, I get the point that, like, on on the event of an expired staple, we do need to decide: do we fail open or fail closed? Um, but is that this is what the switch allows, right? Is do we fail open or do we fail closed? Yeah, I get I get that, but I just do like, I get that hypothetically you may want that. Is this something that's common that people like want? They want they want to make this, this is something we would use. Which option would you use? You'd use both options in different use cases? Yes. So we have um, we have kind of device clients for which OCSP staple is the only way to go. We have non-hardware like soft clients whose OCSP staples don't really matter. We allow CRLs. Yeah, John, are you saying we, we only have one switch saying either one staple or do not want staple? That, I mean, that's what I was. I mean, I'm trying to start at the simplest thing and but, make sure we're only adding fields for, for what we need. I, I mean, yeah. I know it's yeah. just that's right, so I'm not really pushing for one thing. I'm just pushing for the simplest thing that meets these cases. Um, so, yeah, I think at least, at least the, um, two modes, like uh, or, or one Boolean is required. Either saying you have to have staple, other, other, or, or, or saying you do not need a staple at all. Right. I. 
Uh, I yeah. done, Rin? Yeah, go ahead, Akasi. Yeah. Okay. So my 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 concern is, I think we're we're talking different things here. So is this mode something for the server or for the client? I mean, is it something that each client I have three clients connected to a server? Is it a thing of the client? The client one connects to the server and requires staple or doesn't require staple, or is it a property of the server? Server will you know fail if there is a missing staple. Because if the first is would go with destination rule, so it's the server setting are only for what server is doing. Server cannot say client you should validate or should validate or, or whatever. Client can provide the step or 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 uh, certificate chain or whatever. And when it does, it should never, you know, if the step is expired, you should never present it to the client. And then if client requires a valid staple, it will work otherwise. So I'm not against a setting on the client to, to, to do this. My, my question is putting the setting on the server side. That's, that's really what I think. This, this is a server side setting. So server is sending the staple to the client. How would the server enforce and, and fail? So if I send, I have mandatory. Isn't the server sending the staple to the client and client validate it? Uh, no, if there is, if the, if it's must staple, um, there will, there, there will, so, um, so sorry, give me a sec. Must staple um, will the configuration will fail on the envoy side if there is no OCSP staple on the server side. So server will be down if there is no OCSP yeah. staple. So that's the hardest thing. Right? We won't even be you won't even be able to push a configuration to envoy uh, without an OCSP staple. I understand your statement. Strict staple, yeah, on the envoy side, uh, on the server side. Strict stapling is. Um, it will accept a certificate without an OCSP staple, but it won't accept a server with an invalid OCSP staple. Yeah, so I think, Kasten, your and my expectation was that if the oh, if the staple was expired, Envoy would just attach it, and it's up to the client to reject it. But it seems like that's not at least how Envoy works. I don't know how other proxies work. I understand you. you so what you are saying. I'm, I'm not entirely. I need to read a bit about uh, about the staple and and so so you are saying you prefer your server to be completely down and not accept any connection if you you want the staple and and the, the uh, secret doesn't have a valid one. Yeah. So so those are three modes, right? There is there is the lenient one is um, if there is no staple or it's expired, then the certificate will be used without no CSP staple. So that's the kind of that's the default. That's what Envoy runs us today for all the SEO configs. Um, we have strict stapling, which will say that if there is no CSP staple and it is valid, then that will be used. If there is no CSP staple, um, then there will be a connection without OCSP stapling. And then there is a weird middle case where there is an OCSP staple, but it's not valid, in which case the connection will be rejected. OK. Uh, I have a completely different feedback now based on your explanation. Sorry for confusing. So. Uh, I understand your use case. I think it's it's important. Uh, I think our API, especially gateway API, it's already super complicated. Expertise in TLS and this kind of OCL sort of step is even rarer, and it will be very very difficult to to for users to see this option in the actual main API. Now, it will be super. You know, you will move much faster if you. We implement this feature without any API change in, in the gateway API. And either we put an annotation on secret or we put something else on the secret that is kind of a bit more narrow focused and doesn't reflect into the APIs that we need to support and explain and, and to 100% to, to of users and, and, and everyone else. I'm not saying no to the feature. I'm saying how to express this feature may not be ideal if you put it in the in the TLR API, especially since we also want to move to Gamma API, Gateway and Gamma API, and there are a dozen other vendors that don't need to agree on it. Uh, as a feature of Istio, where you load a secret and if it has an annotation, no CSP staple required, you crash the server. That's whatever optional you, you want. That, that's completely you know narrow focused. It's only for the secrets and for the users who need it. It's not something that's exposed to, to, to everyone. And, I don't know what other people believe, but uh, I know there is a pretty sense to put annotations or labels in uh, and use them. But I think this is a case where it's des desert. But how do we add the incantation if you, you just add the incantation based on the label? Or... 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we we'll leave secret in, in, in East UOD. East UOD, we have other labels on the secret. I mean, I think there is, you know, label used for multi-class. There are all kinds of other uses of annotations or labels on secrets. And East UOD can make a decision about this secret based on it. And then you can put the name if you choose, if you want. I mean, we have far more flexibility because the, the expectation of stability testing, uh, you know, because this is a beta API already. I mean, it's not something we can. and, and API that is supposed to be placed by stable by the Kubernetes give API, which can you'll need to have the same discussion and explain this to the other vendors of uh, of gateways. Yeah, I think it's a fight to start with the annotation or the like uh, this uh, informal API. Um, because adding a formal API to it still actually takes a long time. And right now, when you explain the mode, we are already are pretty confused. Why do we have three modes? Yeah. Yeah, it means the customers. That's that's my point. I mean, if if we have trouble speaking ourselves to understand it. Yeah, especially I was not sure why preferred is different from optional. It's... <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, you're just okay. saying it's not required, right? An an annotation annotation is the way to go. Then cool. Uh, um, so um, if we modify the document and. Uh, present pull request, which is uh, doing actual push from SDS to uh, to Envoy. And then uh, is it an approval for, for the feature? I, I think it's very reasonable to support on CSP. I mean, they, are, they are important for other purposes. As far as I understand, to them before, uh, it's not something bad to support. And if it's not something exposing the API, it's clearly more as optional feature alpha or whatever it's you know specific to it it, it 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 avoids a lot of the problems that will be created by modifying the api yeah cool. yeah i think ocf sp is a it's a good feature we should uh, yeah um it's just that we we are not we don't have the complete consensus on the api itself yeah. maybe later more people use it then we can consider as it as a formal api we're going to start conversation with search manager uh in parallel to uh, come to agreement with what would be the name for the field. Yeah. And whatever Sub Major decides, I, I wouldn't even mind if you put it in Citadel. I think we can sign status as well in Citadel, no? So it, for testing and for, for because you need testing and you cannot take a definition of Sub Major for testing. Cool. Okay. Can you update the talk for, uh, and the changes to annotation and we can reveal what annotation we to add? Yep. Thank you. Uh, by the way, one more comment. Uh, Cert Manager, when it creates a, a, a secret, because Cert Manager creates a secret, they will need to put the annotation as well. So it may be an annotation that doesn't include this UIO. It may be something that is a bit more generic, especially since this kind of feature probably, since we want to move to the common gateway with all the other vendors, not only Istio, but Console, Linkerd, and so forth. Uh, this may be a feature that other vendors may pick up and use with their own uh, systems. So no issue I approach in the annotation if possible. Sounds good. All right. Uh, you're done with that topic. Then uh, last but not least, Marion, let's talk about community testing for 117. Yeah, I just wanted to um just give an update and put a link for the community testing spreadsheet that we have for 117 over there so that everyone takes a look and um, if possible, as much as you can help with uh, testing the release. Um, so we just updated the spreadsheet from whenever the last version was with updated priorities and um, automated test status and all those things. So um, yeah, just wanted to put out the link over there so that everyone could take a look at it. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, does anyone While we're post? giving an announcements, uh, mm -hmm. if no one, if people didn't see the Istio Con, actually, I think it's called Istio Day now, is uh, is happening at KubeCon in April. Um, I think there's only like two weeks to submit a proposal. It's a very short timeline. So if you if you want to go to Amsterdam and talk about Istio, now's your, now's your chance. John, what's the deadline? Uh, I think it's February 12th. There, there's a oh, blog post yes, on the Istio IO. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. There's a blog on Istio uh, IO with all the details on how to submit and, and whatnot. So. Uh, 
I was, I was going to ask, um, since you mentioned it, John, is, is there going to be an IstioCon proper, or is this in lieu of that, along with potentially whatever happens at um, KubeCon yeah. US? I can share what I know. Um, I think they do plan IstioCon. So this is only half day at Istio Day at KubeCon, right? So it's only like uh, like four hours. Uh, there will be a virtual IstioCon to accommodate uh, audience from all over the world, which I don't know the exact date. Is that something in steering is planning? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thanks, Lynn. And Eric, I didn't know that, so it's <laughs> good to know. Yeah, also, just a, like, I, I didn't either. I just wanted to confirm. <laughs> yeah, and just a little bit of caveat, um, the KubeCon results should be back soon. You might want to wait uh, on, you know, whether your KubeCon submission is accepted before you submit to Istio Day, um, because in general, if you are accepted for KubeCon, we probably wouldn't take your session for Istio Day, you know what I mean, right? Just give other people a chance to speak, yeah. And I guess the other thing I was going to mention, and I think it is on the blog, is if you do get accepted for the Istio day, you do get a KubeCon admission for both the the day as well as all of KubeCon. Yeah, that is new for KubeCon this year. It used to be you have to pay Colo separately, but now um, the Colo speaker gets the ticket for the whole event as well, which is very cool. All righty. Thank you for all the public service announcements. Uh, any other topics? OK, if not, let's end uh, today's session. And I'll uh, see most of you at the NBM workgroup. Bye-bye now.